as a constitutional law attorney, former senior legal advisor and personal counsel to President Donald J. Trump. Jenna Ellis believes in the rule of law and the importance of integrity in our elections. And she's ready to tackle the big cultural and legal issues facing America. This is The Jenna Ellis Show. Here is your host, Jenna Ellis. Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of The Jenna Ellis Show. I'm Jenna Ellis, and we need to talk about Missouri versus Biden. This is an incredibly important case that just last week on the 4th of July, I don't know if that was intentional or not from the judge, a very important preliminary injunction was handed down by a federal judge against the Biden administration to not collude with big tech for the purposes of censoring viewpoint and debate from especially conservatives, but just any citizens, because that runs afoul of the First Amendment. This is a very important decision, and it's going to be fascinating to see this case progress. Uh, If you have not heard Eric Schmidt, who is the former Attorney General of Missouri, now Senator, uh, previously on this show, you can go back and find those interviews when he was talking about what uh, they actually achieved in discovery, what they, what, uh, they have in terms of evidence. Um, But now we have this 155 page ruling from a federal Trump appointed judge that says, sorry, Biden administration, you cannot use private social media, big tech companies and use them as basically your agents to then censor Americans' viewpoints that you don't prefer. This absolutely makes sense and is consistent with the First Amendment that the government can never act to censor viewpoints that uh, they just simply don't prefer. And so this isn't just a win for conservatives. It's actually a win for free speech. So my good friend Josh Hammer, who is an excellent attorney, and he is also uh, the host of The Josh Hammer Show, and he is the editor-at-large for Newsweek, is going to join me right after this to discuss this ruling and where this case is headed from here. With inflation, the banking world collapse, and everything that Joe Biden is doing not to protect America, you need to make sure to secure your financial health, especially in retirement. And hey, if you're a millennial like me, that actually is sooner than you think. You need to start now, even if you are a millennial or a Gen Zer, to make sure that your financial health is actually healthy when we get to retirement. And Legacy Precious Metals has a revolutionary new online platform that allows you to invest in gold and silver online in real time. In a few easy steps, you can open an account online, select your metals of choice, and choose to have them stored in a vault or shipped right to your door. You'll have access to a dashboard where you can track your portfolio growth in real time anytime. You'll see transparent pricing on each coin and bar, and this puts you in complete control of your money. The platform is free to sign up for. Visit LegacyPMInvestments.com and open your account and see this new investing platform for yourself. Gold hedges against inflation and against a volatile stock market. A truly diversified portfolio isn't just more stocks and bonds, but different asset classes. This brand new platform allows you to make investments in gold and silver, no matter how small or large, with just a few clicks. Visit LegacyPM.com to get started. You can download the free investor's guide, and you can also call Legacy PM Investments to talk to a portfolio expert to get expert answers to your uh, to customize your personal portfolio. So visit LegacyPMInvestments.com to get started. Tell them that Jenna sent you. As we are talking about the First Amendment uh, largely today, if you want to hear more about the 303 Creative case and want to spend uh, more of a deep dive into that, you can go to uh, this week's Christian Outlook from Salem Media. And I joined uh, my pastor in Colorado, Gina Geraci, who hosts uh, Crosstalk in Denver. And uh, on the Friday that the 303 Creative Opinion was released, he and I did an hour on his radio show talking about the... 303 Creative case, and so uh, that is on podcast form if you just uh, Google Christian Outlook, or uh, you can go to their Twitter page, uh, but you can find that with Gino Geraci and me, and uh, we we continue to just talk about um, the implications of that decision. So we'll continue to talk about the First Amendment, and another very important case uh, that was led by the states of Missouri and Louisiana, a federal judge has blocked 
blocked the Biden administration officials from contacting social media companies in a landmark order targeting government censorship and suppression of online postings. This is according to the New York Post's uh, summary. And the U.S. District Court judge, who is a Trump appointee, determined uh, last Tuesday that the White House likely colluded with big tech to censor protected speech during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'd like to welcome in my good friend, Josh Hammer, who is an attorney, the senior editor at large and host of the Josh Hammer show on Newsweek and a syndicated columnist and all around um, just really good uh, legal mind. So, Josh, um, I thought that this was a really great opinion and uh, looking forward to the progress of this case. Yeah, Jenna, always a pleasure to join you. So this was a huge deal. I, I mean, it's kind of it kind of flew under the radar, to be honest with you, at least in many of the circles that I tra- trap again, because it came kind of in light of the kind of fast and furious end of the Supreme Court terms. So people kind of saw this. And they were like, oh, this is like another legal case. Like, who cares? We have these amazing victories and affirmative action and 303 creative. And I, I am totally not downplaying the magnitude of these amazing victories, which I've also spoken and written about elsewhere already at great length. But the point is, this is something absolutely worth focusing on. So you have a 155-page preliminary injunction from a a judge down in Louisiana. So the, the background here is that this is a lawsuit that was jointly filed by the states of Missouri and Louisiana. Jeff Landry is the exceptional attorney general of Louisiana, and Eric Schmidt, who is is now the junior U.S. senator from Missouri. He, he he was the attorney general there, so he worked with his counterpart, Jeff Landry, to file this lawsuit. And they basically allege that there was mass coordination between the Biden administration, between the White House itself, between the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, Health and Human Services, and maybe a few other agencies, uh, including the FBI, but those were really the main actors. There was mass coordination on a weekly or biweekly basis between top people in those departments and the big tech companies like Facebook, Google, YouTube, Twitter as well. And basically the whole purpose of this court, of this coordination communication was to tamp down on so-called COVID-19 misinformation, disinformation, and things like that when it comes to vaccines, mass mandates. And many of us kind of really thought that this was true because you could kind of see it if you if you really were just looking with both eyes open. We all saw Jen Psaki, then the White House press secretary, at the White House press podium back in July 2021, who was actually openly bragging about the fact that she was coordinating with Facebook. So they weren't doing a very good job of hiding this. And sure enough, in this 155-page ruling from Judge Doty in Louisiana, the evidence is there. I mean, we have seen the evidence that is that thankfully this is what litigation does. Jenna, you're a lawyer, you know this. We we get to discovery and we kind of see the emails, we see the redacted communication, and we we see that what Louisiana and Missouri have alleged actually happened. And it's a really, really, really big deal because we're finally, finally, finally beginning to crack the nut of how to stop this public-private censorship that comes when the federal government basically assumes the role of a censor by co-opting the technology companies. So it's, it's a huge, huge deal, and it's a massive, massive vindication right now for free speech. Obviously, we have a ways to go in the litigation. We'll see what happens on appeal, but for now, it's definitely worth celebrating. Absolutely. And and I couldn't agree more with that analysis. And I think um, in part, this flew under the radar a little bit because uh, the opinion, whether intentional or not by the judge, was uh, released on the 4th of July, which um, I thought, if not intended, you know, where the judge uh, put it out on the 4th of July, it's at least a little bit of of irony uh, to say that, you know, he was going to put out this 155 page opinion on, you know, the very day that we're celebrating our independence and freedom from government tyranny. Um, So so I think, you know, a lot of people were more focused a little bit on celebrating the holiday than they were watching the news or, you know, listening uh, to radio or or things like that. But um, but but I agree with you, Josh Hammer, that this uh, this 
this case and the trajectory, which you and I have been following. And um, for those who want to hear more, I, I had uh, Eric Schmidt on when he was still the AG uh, multiple times on my podcast. You can still find those at the Jenna Ellis show dot com uh, talking about the discovery uh, that they that they did get in this case that has now led to this one hundred fifty five page opinion and um, and moving forward how uh, this this is so important for the First Amendment because you know this case it, the, the fundamental premise here is that the government can't co-opt a private sector company and just uh, and basically use them as a pass through to say well it's a private company that's not governed by the First Amendment so if the government is simply telling these social media giants what to suppress and what is or is not misinformation according to the government then that's fine according to the First Amendment because uh, the First Amendment doesn't apply to private companies. And so so they can't have that type of uh, collusion and cooperation. And the judge actually wrote in this case, uh, this targeted suppression of conservative ideas is a perfect example of viewpoint discrimination of political speech. American citizens have the right to engage in free debate about significant issues affecting the country. The evidence produced thus far depicts an almost dystopian scenario. And yet, Josh, uh, the Biden administration, as you mentioned, has been you know, fully open with the fact that they think they can do this constitutionally or they just don't care about the Constitution, which I think is more likely. And the White House's response to this decision was, wow, we are you know, we are just trying to combat the proliferation of misinformation. And it's like they don't even care that they're violating the First Amendment. Right. I, I, I think the White House is and the, the Department of Justice's reaction to this was maybe the most damning thing of all. I mean, uh, this judge has this remarkable ruling literally analogizing the Biden administration censorship apparatus with George Orwell's Ministry of Truth from 1984. That's not an exaggeration. He literally puts that analogy, that description, in his preliminary injunction. And, you know, Jenna, what is the What is the immediate reaction from the Biden administration, the Department of Justice? They're like, oh, my God, like, how could the judge say this? We're going to appeal. I mean, they're literally appealing. They are literally appealing for the right to pressure companies to censor speech that the government itself, that the Biden administration does not contest. This is an important point, Jenna. The government does not actually contest that the information that they are seeking to suppress would be First Amendment protected if it were simply said from a a, a sidewalk or or a different piece of government property. They they actually openly concede that. It's not like they're saying that this is not constitutionally protected speech. They just take this ridiculously and ultimately unsustainable uh, hard line between the so-called public and the so-called private. And, And the reason that I say that that is an unsustainable line, you know, this lawsuit, uh, obviously, Missouri and Louisiana filed the suit, but there's also some individual plaintiffs involved. And those individual plaintiffs are represented by a firm called the New Civil Liberties Alliance based in Washington, D.C., which is headed by one of my absolute favorite legal scholars in the country, a man by the name of Philip Hamburger. And uh, Professor Hamburger had a great op-ed in the Wall Street Journal last month kind of laying out this argument that I personally found very persuasive, which is, You know, a lot of people say that in order to find a First Amendment violation in a situation like this, you would have to find that the technology companies are are, are just public actors, period, full stop, end of story, that they are so heavily coerced and intimidated by the government that they can be subject to the First Amendment and other kind of constitutional limitations. But if you look at the text of the First Amendment, Jenna, and what it actually stops the First Amendment from doing when it comes to free speech... The text speaks of abridging the right to free speech. So the point that Professor Hamburger, who, again, is leading some of the individual plaintiffs in this very case, Missouri versus Biden, the point that he made, and I think it's a very astute point, is that you don't actually need these private technology companies to become full throttle public or state actors. You simply need the government to put enough pressure on them so as to abridge your constitutionally protected free speech rights. And I, I, again, it, this is all right there in the preliminary injunction. It's very, very good stuff. And again, we'll see what happens on appeal. But 
this is the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. It's actually the same court that I clerked on five years ago or so. It's, it's, it's a right of center court. So I, I tend to be, I, I tend to be cautiously optimistic about this one. It's been, you know, I, I feel like I'm in a bit of a whiplash. I'm usually pessimistic about all things judicial branch related, <laughs> but the past few weeks have given me at least some cause for optimism, I guess. Yeah. And isn't that a way better feeling than always, you know, the doom and gloom that we've sort of come to expect from uh, from the court or from uh, the judiciary over, you know, really, I I think our legal careers. And now we're kind of suddenly seeing these amazing opinions that really are protecting uh, the text of the Constitution and the design of government and the rights that we understand come from God, our creator, not our government. And so it is remarkable, Josh Hammer, that that uh, the Biden administration is actually appealing this, like, you know, the, 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 not just saying, yeah, of, of course we shouldn't uh, collude with big tech and we don't want to censor anybody from publicly debating things of importance and having uh, political viewpoints. And certainly we don't want to discriminate. I mean, it, it's it's remarkable and I think completely uh, telling of the posture of the Biden administration that they're actually appealing this and what their arguments are. Um, and that speaks to the level of sheer, um, not just ignorance, but willful ignoring of the role and responsibility of government um, as a whole, but also specifically under the U.S. Constitution and our framework in America. And you mentioned uh, as well the Wall Street Journal opinion, and uh, that that piece, uh, July 5th, uh, is titled, for those who want to go and read it, um, I certainly am, because I appreci- always appreciate what uh, Josh writes and also what he recommends. Um, so I didn't see this one, but I pulled it up, and it's uh, titled, A Key Ruling Against Social Media Censorship uh, by Philip Hamburger. And um, Josh, in the last just few minutes that uh, we have with this, so this is just a preliminary injunction, but it is important because right now, uh, now the specific actors in the Biden administration are precluded from colluding with big tech in order to censor a political viewpoint. Uh, But this case has a long way to go. So um, what is the next step for those who want to follow this? And where uh, do you anticipate this trajectory going? Well, immediately, the, the, the parties involved, and specifically the federal government, the Biden administration, is going to sue for a stay of the preliminary injunction. You know, basically, what, what that means is that they're going to sue for the right to continue to have their communications with the technology companies until the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals actually issues a definitive ruling on this. And tough to say exactly how that panel, when it gets to that, will rule on, on the request to stay the preliminary injunction. We actually just saw this past weekend um, the Sixth Circuit actually did stay a, a misguided preliminary injunction in, in Tennessee when it came to Tennessee's law with respect to so-called transgender surgeries for minors. So in, in that case, a conservative Sixth Circuit panel did stay a, a misguided preliminary injunction from a, from a liberal district court judge there. So we'll see what happens here. But, you know, again, I, I actually am consciously optimistic about the way this case ultimately plays out when it gets to the Fifth Circuit, uh, at least a, a, a full panel there. And again, there's always a luck of the draw element here. So in a, case, in a court like the Fifth Circuit, you have, you know, 15 to 18 judges or so. It, the three-judge panel is quite literally going to be a random draw. But this is, this is a higher-profile case. It's the kind of case that could make it to kind of a, 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 a so-called en banc rehearing where the full court agrees to rehear. And in that case, you kind of have to like our odds, the odds on the side of sanity, at least on a court like that. So I, I do tend to be cautious, optimistic, but it is a long and winding road. But, you know, it, it really is a vindication, Jenna. Some of us, like myself and many others, have been sounding the alarm for years now on how the Democratic Party and the ruling class in general has, has tried to use government power to effectively co-opt the private sector, the big tech companies more than anyone else, to do their bidding. And it, it felt like many of us have been shouting into the wilderness here, trying to kind of throw out some of these legal theories. And, and there really is some inherent value to having a lot of this validated by an Article Three federal judge. It's right there now within the federal reporter. People can go ahead and read it for themselves. So it, it really is a, a, a good day. And I think in many ways, kind of the doctrines are a change in and, you know, the times are a change in, in this field as well.
Which is so great. Perhaps a return to sanity. So Josh Hammer, always really appreciate it. And you can find uh, Josh not only in Newsweek, but also the Josh Hammer show. Uh, He just posted uh, today's show. The Supreme Court term is now over. And uh, he is joined by a Sixth Circuit judge to discuss the legacy of Justice Clarence Thomas. So if you're interested in that, go to the Josh Hammer show. And we will be back tomorrow with more here on Jenna Ellis to talk about truth in government and making sure we are pre- Preserving and protecting our rights that come from God. Have you ever picked up a towel set because it felt so soft in the store, but then when you leave and you go to use it, it's not really that absorbent? It's basically a towel that is leaving you out to dry. That's why MyPillow has developed the MyPillow towels, towels that actually work. I know, it's totally mind-blowing. Towels that actually dry you. Their six-piece towel set includes two bath towels, two hand towels, and two washcloths. They come in a variety of colors, I have the sage green and the white. I love them. And right now you can receive a six piece set for only $39.98 with promo code Jenna. That's J-E-N-N-A. So go to MyPillow.com right now and click on the radio listener special. MyPillow products come with a 10 year warranty and have a 60 day money back guarantee. So to receive this amazing offer on the six piece towel set of MyPillow towels, just go to MyPillow.com, click on the radio listener special and enter promo code Jenna, that's J-E-N-N-A, or call 1-800-564-8475. That's MyPillow.com, promo code Jenna.